Welcome to Patent Pending. I'm your host, Gabriel Moncow. Today, I am joined at the top left by Ryan Karp, French horn player, pianist, and a longtime TSA and robotics member. At the top right, we have Nikhil Narwani, celebrity-level saxophone player, jazz enthusiast, hey. and does too much music stuff to list. Uh, bottom left, Matthew Mulhall, baritone horn player, chorus singer, and D&D enthusiast. And at the bottom right, Andrew Chung, violinist, robotics driver, and orchestra member. How are you guys doing today? Good. How are you? Chilling. Glad to be here. I see you recycled one of my titles, but that's fine. (laughs) It's kind of rough out here, okay? I look at you and I think D&D, but today we're talking about music. Yeah, I know. We could do a D&D podcast, but we need to pull some other people for that. Oh, Jesus. You could like play D&D while friends. doing a D&D podcast. That uh, is interesting. How about too. not? How about we not <laughs> stretch that and then, thin? And then I'll, I'll pay $5 to see Matt Dab again. Oh, my God. That was <laughs> some of the greatest. I still can't live that sure. down. <laughs> oh, was that you? I thought that was Justin. No, Actually, no, that was Lucas Justin. Souza. That was Lucas Souza who paid $5. No, I, th- that, no, I think it Justin. was Gilfu. Gilfu? I think it was. Susan also donated, but I think it was. I think Justin did that one in particular. Anyway, so we'll just jump right into it. I think we have to, with as most of these, we kind of have to start at the beginning, right? So I just want to know. I feel like a lot of you guys have different stories as you got into this whole field. Like, how did you guys get into music? Was there something specific that triggered it all, or have you always sort of wanted to get into this stuff? I actually hated it when I started. Same. Yeah, like Do tell. I started. Yeah, I started in second grade. I went to element Virginia Schumann Young Elementary. It was a public Montessori school, and we had to take a music class, I think, on rotation. And it was, like, kind of block classes. You have, like, this election that you rotate, elective that you rotate. And I absolutely hated it um, in second, third grade. Fourth grade, my parents started making me take lessons, and I hated that as well. And it wasn't until seventh grade where I got my music teacher, Miss McDonald at North Broward, that I actually started liking it. So I think it's very common for a lot of people to have that one teacher that makes you like it. So that's my story. But I don't know. Matt. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess I'm not. Um, I don't know. I've always been exposed to music, not, not necessarily playing it. Either of my parents play. But my dad always played music in the house, just like, you know, through speakers and stuff. And that was like one of the things that I, I would listen to music like to sleep and stuff. And so when I got the actually one of my earliest memories is when we were looking for schools, uh, we were looking at schools when I was going to kindergarten or something is that we walked. Gang. Yeah, but we actually but the memory is actually at Pinecrest because I did tour there. And one of the things I remember is walking through the band room and they had risers in there at that time. And I could just see the back of the risers and people playing trombone. And I was like, I want to do that. I didn't end up doing that, but I own a trombone because of it. Um, even though I have no idea how to play it, but um, I eventually, when we got the opportunity later, I was like, yeah, sure. I'll try it. Um, and ended up playing, not the instrument I had wanted to since I was little, but baritone. And then um, I don't know always i've enjoyed it since only two years ago did i join chorus uh one of my handful of regrets of high school of not doing that earlier because i didn't know you could um and have enjoyed the crap out of that since so both still but you know i don't know i've I've enjoyed it from the start i think I i don't have quite the i don't have quite the turn on it that i did before that, that, or rather than I think a lot of people have or that Andrew or Chong were talking about. Yeah. Like, I, so. I think I started off with piano, and I think a lot of people started off with piano. Um, and, like, the kind of aging thing that your parents make you only play piano or violin. Like, Nikhil, like, I don't know how I know you do exactly it. exactly how you feel, bro. I have no idea how you do it with saxophone. But, um, yeah, my parents were only, like, piano, violin, nothing else. And... Piano, like, I actually regret stopping piano now because, like, since I like music now, I'm like, wow, piano is, like, the base for everything. You can go off anything with piano. Um, And then, so I did piano early. I was, like, first through second grade. And then I stopped that. And then second, third grade, I picked up violin at public school. Um, And I thought it was terrible because it sounded like nails on chalkboard. Like, it was so bad. And then... um, 
Yeah, and then after that, in middle school is when I started doing more stuff at North Broward. Um, and I joined the Florida Youth Orchestra, so I did stuff outside of school. And then I really started investing my time in violin, and I started actually enjoying it. Um, and it, it, I think it helps that my teachers after seventh grade were making me do things other than classical music. Because I think when you start off with an instrument, you're like, it's not no, it's not any fault for like how it's set up. Because I think it's important as well. You get this really strong classical like um, education, and then people forget that it gets it's fun because like, it's not like classical isn't fun, but it's more strict if you know what I'm saying. And yep. then when you start doing the fun stuff like jazz and um, like you get into pop music and all that stuff, it gets um, you start to see how classical music is related to that and like um yeah and how it's fun as well and then you find classical music fun so i did just remember i i forgot something which is that my grandparents own owned and own a grand piano and so my grand my grandmother did teach me piano like on that from when i was little but i kind of fell off of it and then picked it up again at one point and then fell off of it again so i just forgot just remembered i'll be right back yeah uh, i also started with piano in kindergarten um my brother started at the same time but he quit pretty much immediately and then the next year he went into orchestra but that's not really important but it matters later on because in fourth grade since he was in orchestra i was like well i should join bands and i decided to pick up the french horn which became kind of my main instrument but i stuck with piano for a while um but then my piano teacher left and the next teacher i had I still like her a lot, you know, she's she's a great teacher, but she made me go like entirely into into classical when really I was playing piano for like movie music and like, you know, the fun stuff. And so I ended up stopping piano in like ninth grade and focusing entirely on French horn then. And I was pretty good for like a year and then I started falling off. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I actually, yeah, no, because this is funny because Matt, me and Brian really like grew up in that environment. I mean, I joined a little late, so I started playing music in fourth grade. And it was because my brother, who's three years younger than me, said he wanted to be a rock star. So my parents picked up this like really old beater piano and stuck it in the living room. And they were like, okay, well, now you're going to have lessons. And I was so mad at them. I was like, you can't make me do this. This is ridiculous. I don't want to play piano. And I had one lesson and I fell in love with it. And I think I like what um, Chung was saying, because I think there is like a really very large emphasis for, especially for young musicians on cl like the classical yeah. side of things. And I'm not a big classical guy. I, I can play classical. I've played classical for a while, but it's not really what I do. And I think it's really important for people to obviously understand like the basis of what music is, but I I wish there was a little more like variation. That's why our lower middle school band director, John Aiello, one of the coolest people I know, really. Like he made me fall in love with everything about the music. And he, what we would do is we'd have, basically like you'd separate the year into two halves basically. So you'd have our like competition sort of like part where we'd play pretty serious classical stuff, basically band arrangements, stuff for wind ensemble. And then we'd do something in like March, March, right guys? Yeah. Post MPA. Um, yeah. So we'd have like the performance assessment MPA where we go and get graded on how we played something. And then after that, we do something called symphonic pops where we'd play like film scores, musical scores, stuff like that. And that, I think that was really important in my like, branching out because it was after that that I started like I joined jazz band and I was like this is great and I got into the bigger jazz band in seventh grade and I was like this is amazing and that really like started it for me personally but that's pretty much how I started and then I've tried to not let go of it since I stopped playing piano but I, yeah I also regret that and I've gone back to it more for supplementing my practice on sax but yeah so I think on that, the trombone. 
Yeah, nice. I saw you brought it over. <laughs> nice. Yeah. You had that for ages, bro. I remember coming over to your house and we'd like mess with it. Oh yeah, since I was <laughs> very little. It's like my grandfather's like friend was a part of it. Was in a band mm. that like played like the country club in their neighborhood, and he stopped, and so they he somehow managed to get me this. It's yeah, still it's one of tiny. them. Now that I'm yeah. holding it, like. <laughs> Also, miraculously, having never greased the slide, it's wow. perfectly fine. I've That's never, t- I've never done any maintenance on this thing, and it's perfectly fine. It's another one of the instruments I will never understand. Oh yeah, it, it doesn't saw... make it doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I listen. I am not about any instrument that you have to change the size of it for it to change um, <laughs> pitch. I'm not about that. Yeah. Oh yeah, bass trombone. <laughs> I could never. You have to like extend your art out, like. Yeah. <laughs> but any instrument that you have to be careful about, like concussing concussing someone in front of you with, you should probably. You know, or maybe yeah. you should get it because if you sit behind someone you hate, then you just go. <laughs> yeah. With the little handle. Also, any instrument that you have any deviation between playing one note and then waiting and then playing the note again, like you can yeah. play the same note way differently on trombone. I'm, I hate that shit. Oh yeah. <laughs> Welcome to brass. Yeah, I could never imagine having to change your like pitch with your harmonic frequency of your mouth. I could never. Yeah, such so fun. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I have no experience with uh, using band instruments and using your mouth. So everything is in my fingers. Hey, got even me. worse. He just doesn't even <laughs> use mouth at all. So yeah, strings, man. Um, it's, but it's I think different. that is interesting. No, I was just going to say, since we're, we're, while we're still talking about like how you guys got started and stuff, um, I think something interesting to mention as well that you guys could get into is, was there like a specific inspiration for you at the start? Uh, it sounds like a lot of you got started because of external circumstances, whether it be parents yeah. or like you just sort of had an instrument or something. So maybe when you did get started, was there a specific artist or a certain song that you really wanted to play that motivated you to keep going uh, or a style or something that you could see yourself playing, anything like that? Mm, well, for me, first, it was actually, yeah. what's it? Go for it, John. You can, you can, you can go. Yeah. All right. For me, it was actually, um, I mean, I had been playing for a couple of years or a year at this point, but for me, it was this experience at one of our competitions in sixth grade that really like made me get serious about it. And it was also the direction of Mr. Aiello because he was, he's old school. He would yell at you if you didn't know your part and he would make you play down the line oh, yeah. and make sure everyone knew his parts. And it was, it was stressful but um it was sixth grade we had a quartet for we were playing a classical piece i don't remember the name something by Haydn, maybe but um we like we had been practicing it was grade three and we'd only been playing for a year or two it was me kevin harvey drew morris and Derek pfeffer boys i'm still friends with love those guys and we were just like, okay, we know how to play it. Like we'd play, we'd practice it together, went to each other's houses, practiced it a little bit, knew our parts. But the thing with the music was it was it had a lot of repeats in like three different codas, which I, I don't know how it was graded to three, but I think you can see where this is going. We played through it, we started, we sounded pretty good. Uh, I was on alto, so it was Derek. Drew was on Barry and Derek was on tenor, I think. It might have been something different, but or Kevin was on tenor um, and we were playing through it. It was just fine. And then we got to one of the repeats where you have to. It was like a D S L code. So you go back to a symbol that's designated on somewhere in the music and we stopped, just completely stopped. And it was oh. the worst that, thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah, I mean, probably not, but it was I felt my face getting red. It was like, oh, my God, this actually just happened. And um there's a grading scale so there's superior excellent good fair and poor and we got graded a fair which is i think one of the lowest grades that any pinecrest student has ever gotten at a solo it's called the solo ensemble day event and that really just made me sort of want to practice more and it wasn't it wasn't until probably high school where i decided to like i really want to pursue jazz so i was listening to different artists Cannibal Adderley, probably one of my bigger influences. But yeah, what about you guys? I had a moment in Solon Ensemble, but thankfully it happened at uh, the, the county one. 
Mm-hmm. So you only needed a excellent or above to go on to states. Oh, we didn't and, have states. Oh, yeah. And so it was me and Rodrigo. I don't know if you guys. I love Rod. And we were playing El Choclo, and it's a it's a tango, and we it's it's a really like good tango. Like I I liked playing it, and. During the, the, when we were playing it in front of the judge, I didn't set up my second page. It's two pages. So right when we jumped to the second page, I was like, shit, like, I don't, like, there's nothing. So for like five, ten seconds, I was scrambling to put the second page up. And thankfully, Rodrigo kept playing as if nothing was happening. So I jumped right back in at the right spot. But like, during that moment, I completely, like, I thought we were going to fail because, you know, you, you you have like this 10 seconds of nothing from the second violin part. And um, when we finished, the judge was like, next time, make sure you set, set up your second page before you start. And I was like, yeah, I was like, um, other than that, it was really good. And I was expecting to get like a good because it was county level. So the grading is much easier. So I was expecting to get like a good. And I was like, after that, I was like apologizing profusely to Rodrigo. I was like, I'm sorry. I know it's your senior year. And I screwed up. And um, for some reason, I don't know if the judge was being like nice that day, but he still gave us a superior. And in the notes, he was like, oh, yeah, um, everything was good. Just like work on this little thing. But um, overall, just make sure you have up. So I think like uh, at like the state level, it's much more crit- like critical because like I've, I've also played a solo memorized um, at state level where at county it got superior with distinction. And then at States, I played the same thing, if not better, in my opinion. So I don't know if that's biased or not. But um, the judge gave me a good, and he didn't write anything on the remarks page. I was so confused. So, yeah, Maybe you just didn't like, like the piece. <laughs> yeah, the state judges no, but the are thing, rough, bro. He, he, no, but after the thing, for like five minutes, he kept me after, and he asked me, like, where'd you find the piece? He's never heard it before. And my teacher is Russian, and she's from she's from Russia, and she got her PhD from a conservatory in Moscow, and so she has all these books of like what, and she was studying there when it was still the Soviet Union. So she has all like um, the music stuff from the Soviet Union, like, and it's like still classical stuff, but like a lot of the pieces are from Russian composers that like the famous ones too, like Tchaikovsky. And um, that no one's heard of because they only focus on like the big ones and whatnot. And um, so the judge was asking me for like five minutes, like, where'd you get this? This is so cool, blah, blah, blah. So I don't even know if it's not the song. So I'm like even more confused. So I don't know. Judges are weird. Yeah. Maybe it was like, was it like an invalid piece or something? Like they, No, it you, was a valid piece. Because yeah. no, no. they wouldn't even give you a score if it was an invalid piece. Yeah. No, fair enough. And I, hmm. in a because this was at states so i was like super confused and yeah my miss shapiro came up after and she asked me she's like were you feeling off like i was sick that day so like i um but like i don't know when you get into like the performance moment you don't feel any of the sickness i don't know what happened to you guys like you mm-hmm. just get in the zone and like you could have like fingers could be full well, you guys don't use your fingers that much but my fingers could be like in pain from playing for so long or something but like when i get in the zone i just don't feel anything and it's like zombie mode forward but like yeah i i got in the zone and i was like i don't know how i, I didn't know what to get like come out of that Sean, so, how do you think you play a saxophone without your fingers well like it's <laughs> i mean <laughs> more emphasis on i know well, I, on your yeah, no, i'm messing gonna, with I you have, like, pain in my fingers from moving because yeah, no. you have to technical exercises mostly most of the stuff is like in my mouth so like the way that your armature sits it sits your bottom lip sits on your teeth so i have like a permanent scar right there like from just Jesus. playing hmm. so uh, what about Wait. you matt and carp did you guys have any specific like inspiration when you were getting started or something that motivated you yeah, I, I mean, good. For me, it was always like it was John Williams. All of his movie scores. Yeah. What wanted me to play? What made me want to play everything? I guess at first, specifically Star Wars. That's like the first piece I remember like playing at all. And then from there, it was like I played Jurassic Park in like fourth grade, and 
like the whole time for everything I was always like kind of pushing to try to do like especially in band and when we would do like the symphonic pop stuff I'd want us to do Star Wars or something that had to do with John Williams I guess like definitely my main inspiration was him but I'm not really sure where everything else came from were you in the um Star Trek Orchestra last year. Yeah, that was that was yeah. really fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, like I, I did oh yeah, you guys had like a full orchestra thing. Yeah, we did a full orchestra thing, and it's like really hard for like anyone not in college to do a full orchestra thing. Mm-hmm. And that, it was like so nice because um, you've got like like playing in all strings. Like like since I did full orchestra at Florida Youth Orchestra at Symphony, and like just having like a brass section and a percussion section. Like, it really makes it a lot different. So, like, I'm kind of jealous that you guys have, like, the timpani and all the cool the cool things over there. But, Imagine um, playing an instrument that is included in a full orchestra. Couldn't be. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah saxophones are not considered part it's of It's the orchestra. dumbest thing, though, because everyone's like, oh, saxophones don't blend. Like, they're not part of an orchestra. But, Dude, they, but were, they do. That's they the were thing. built <laughs> purposely to blend. Like, altos blend with French horns. Tenors blend with baritones. There's a video out there that I watched, and I think it was the reason why saxophone isn't um, I love in, that video. in orchestra. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's because this one conductor was like being annoying. And yeah, like, that's because no. the inventor, like Adolf yeah. Sax was like an asshole. So they were like, no, yeah. we're not going to use orchestra. <laughs> we're not going to use your instrument. It was like so stupid. Yeah. So now it's just re- reduced. I use that in quotes because it's like, it's not reduced at all. It's like just like jazz, whatever. Mm-hmm. And you, it, it's it's sad because like it could be used in other ways that yeah that's that, why modern yeah. modern classical composers are really like advancing the use of the saxophone especially like experimental avant-garde stuff they use it as more like not as a melodic effect but more like a sound effect in many ways like they use like a soprano to just like bend notes and stuff like that and it's very useful for more experimental classical like maybe not traditional classical stuff yeah so even though yeah. I know it's not, that just seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> like new classical. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. So that's why there's not many like there's not many established concertos or like suites for saxophone. Like when I was looking for pieces for my my last few solo ensembles, it was actually really hard to find upper level pieces for them. I ended up doing something about Alexander Glazunov and I did some reading into it and basically the only reason he like wrote it, it was in the 1930s or something. And that was like the tail end of romanticism in Russia. And the only reason he wrote it was just so he could like get his like bid in for this new instrument that was being utilized. I mean, it's a sick piece. I love it. Yeah. It's probably one of the coolest pieces I've ever played, but yeah. So I think um, you all, you all have a lot of experience in a lot of these different areas. Uh, you're throwing around a lot of terms, like a lot of things that you've been involved in. Um, for people that don't necessarily know what all these things mean, not necessarily the technical terms, but like programs or activities that you've been involved in, or I mean, you've mentioned a competition or two. Um, what do you? What were those that you've done in in the past? Whether it be the highlights or things that you've heard of that you think are very prevalent in the industry or something like that. Can you just talk a little bit about those? Um, I can I can at least speak to I mean I could probably speak to band but there's two other people who could do the same thing so I won't steal their airtime. what I can talk uh, mention is the chorus stuff I was only in chorus for two years and I had I was extremely fortunate to be presented and be able to take advantage of some, a bunch of opportunities the first of which being the candlelight performance that Disney does every year is they do their Christmas songs like a concert of Christmas songs they have a bunch of they have school like students audition for it like school by school and then the schools come down and they perform so i got to be a part of that the, literally my first semester in chorus then we auditioned for and were accepted to uh perform in the in carnegie hall in new york and so we with a, a group called manhattan concert productions was having their 20th anniversary so they were doing mozart's coronation mass and so we had or they were doing three pieces, but we were doing Coronation Mass. And so we learned all that, then flew up to New York and were there for five days and we sung in Carnegie Hall, which was awesome. And I'd never been to New York before. So that was a whole other animal outside of the music. But, and then this year we did with that same group, they did, um, I forget what anniversary of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, 
which we learned and went with the same group and then performed with actual Broadway actors and actresses doing the, you know, the stage stuff. And we were just the background chorus. And it was the same thing. They had a ton of different high schools and some college people and some independent people come in and do all that thing. And it was, it was incredible. I mean, it, I, I don't know. I like singing. <laughs> That's why I joined <laughs> chorus. I'm not super technical about it because I have only been doing it for two years. And so it was, it's super cool to see, you know, how pros do it and get to work with people and, you know, see how professionals work through things and how they get their point across. And it's like, this is what you need to do with the music. This is how you do it, do it. And they, you know, everyone has high expectations of you. And when you can meet them, at least as a group, who knows, I can't claim if I met them personally or not. It's really cool. And so I don't know. I mean, that's kind of like the, I lucked out like a lot <laughs> that I got to be a part of those things. I, I, who knows if I'm, if I have the ability to back up whether or not I should have been there in the first place, but you should have for core. Uh, sure. Thanks. You, you worked hard <laughs> to do it. I mean, like I was, yeah. we auditioned as a group. I, w I wasn't even in the audition for the, for the <laughs> Joseph one. I wasn't there that day. So, but other people were who didn't go. So, oh, well, a bunch of, like all around the world, um, musicians are like, I want to play at Carnegie Hall. And then I know. Mad. And it's like, I like <laughs> lucked into it. And I'm like, I want to play at Carnegie Hall. That'd be sick. Like, yeah, it's, it's nice. So you got the experience. Take advantage of it. No, I know. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm so. so hopefully I get the chance. I mean, right now my path isn't really in the music direction, but hopefully I can, you know, take a few, take a few side routes along the way. And do that again because I, I loved it the whole, the whole time so well so in orchestra we have two main ones for the school we have mpas which band also does music performance assessment and we have solo and ensemble so mpas is just the entire orchestra gets rated um and then so like we practice three pieces and we go perform in front of the judges they grade us we get a rating very good excellent superior um, this year we got straight superiors, which was really nice. And then there's solo and ensemble, which we couldn't be banned. <laughs> looks at the camera. Um, and then for first didn't um, do so hot either. So yeah. So um yeah, it's mostly down to Mr. Corey. Like he really worked us. Like, he's Guy's he's a, a great conductor. He, he's a great genius. conductor. Like uh, he and, and it shows because he has so much passion for it. Um and like. He brought in Black Violin to a Zoom call the other day because he knew them from college. Um, they did A flat, which we covered. Um, he apparently worked with Alicia Keys, which was like really cool. Yeah, he was a big um, cat in New York. Yeah, he was. He was. He was a big dog. Um, so, yeah, and then we have solo and ensemble, which uh, you do solos or you do ensembles. That's the name. So, an ensemble for those who don't know is any group larger than one and smaller than. 14 or else it's called a, a, a small orchestra i forgot the term uh, mm -hmm. yeah whatever orchestra um, a small group. it's like yeah. chamber ensemble i think is like yeah, chamber it's ensemble. Like yeah so it's a, about 14 is a chamber orchestra or whatever so anything between 2 and 14 you're good and it's the same thing you practice you play um i personally didn't do these other competitions but i know um a lot of people in my orchestra did it there's all county and all all county and all state um which you also audition to play with the best musicians in your county and the best position um, musicians in your state and jimmy said it was like the best orchestra he's ever played for and jimmy's like a really talented musician he plays violin viola and percussion um and he's played all three like at well not professionally but like at a high school level like really high so like he did symphony orchestra um no he did principal orchestra at fio which is their highest um orchestra he played timpani for them he also played viola for them um and then he played violin and viol he plays viola at school he's also good at violin and then for all state he played i don't remember but he played violin or viola and he said it was like the best experience he could have ever done so like the, i i don't know how it is at other states but i'm assuming like the big states have a lot of talented musicians and it's a lot less than like the smaller states. Um, and I think 
personally, well, well, at least when I was younger, there was a lot at my public school, there's emphasis in music, even though they're trying to slash the budget and all that. Um, so I think Florida has been doing a, an OK job, a decent job at it. I can't say for other states. And then because um, in Florida, there seems to be a lot of infrastructure behind it. Um, and then there is um, this other thing that Katrina Reyes and Ivy Rao did where they did star strings or something where basically they auditioned for Ichak Perlman and they got to be conducted by Ichak Perlman. And I don't if you guys don't know, Ichak Perlman is like one of the if not the best violinist alive currently. Um <laughs> And I think if you don't if you don't know who he is, um, he played Schindler's List in Schindler's List. He played the song, the piece there. Um, oh. So like he's like he's like out. He's really good. Um, I, I think I'm rambling a little bit on how good he is, but like there's that. that. So you compete for that. And then um, there's a bunch of local orchestras you can audition for, like Florida Youth Orchestra, Gold Coast Orchestra, all that. And then internally at our school, we've got you didn't audition for the pit orchestra, but like, I think there's some kind of selection process for it. I think they just like, they just emailed whoever, like it would yeah. cross reference, like yeah. instrumentation with you could play. Yeah. So they asked if you could play and if you said yes, you could go in. But it, if any Pinecrest musicians are listening to this and you, you don't have experience in chorus or theater and you really like playing, I highly recommend you to do pit orchestra. It's the yeah. best experience I've ever had um it, it's it's amazing so that's like all the rundown of competitions at orchestra and then i don't know you guys could speak for band but hey carp you want to get that <laughs> um so band is certainly interesting um we've had two kind of three conductors because i still I, even though we never are in high school alone um, even though we never actually had Dr. C, like we basically did. Yeah. He came to Boca. He came to Boca times. a few times. I miss that man. Yeah. So we got to see three very different conductors who had three very different styles. And I can say for sure which one's the best, but not which one's the worst. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I think Mr. Aiello sits on top of that list. Well, absolutely. To regardless of what, who of those three, I think yeah. that, you know. Mr. Yeah, that's the other three. Mr. Ayala was you fantastic. Can't, you can't like, compare to him. He's he's a special kind I feel of. Like if you can sum it up if we could just find that picture of him, him jumping. Yeah, of yeah. him jumping, yeah. and his feet are above the stands. Yeah. Whoa. Like he's like. And he's like he, you, you can see like the veins on like the side in his temple. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> he's like conducting, picture. but his yeah. feet are above the stands. It's like the most <laughs> absurd. It's on the wall in the band room. I don't know if it's still there, but it was. Probably not. But <laughs> like that says a lot about it. That guy was far and away the best conductor I've had, save maybe Mr. Corey. Mr. Corey's also. Mr. Corey's great. Very great. different I feeling, think. but like commands the same kind of respect from the band. Yeah. I think I think Ilo and Mr. Corey both had like that same like fiery passion for what they do. Mm-hmm. Dude, like I think we had like first uh, MPAs. We had we played three pieces, and at the end, it looked like he ran like a marathon, like he was yeah. sweating. And that's when you know like your conductor's super into it because mm-hmm. like like they go all in, and when they come out, they're just like drenched in sweat. And yeah. everyone's like, "What do they do? They just wave a baton." But it's like just mental. Most you of guys played mental. Nimrod for MPA, right? Yeah. Yeah, I like. I, I remember when we were doing. You guys were doing that concert, and Mr. Corey was con- uh, conducting it. Probably the most. First of all, his his emphasis on intonation, especially in the piece like that, yeah. was because it's impactful. slow. You can't yeah. screw up. It's you have slow. these really, really complex chords where you're just like stacking chords on top of each other, and you have to have that exact like minuscule like intonation yeah. errors, and then it's just going to throw everything off. And I think he's very, very focused on the fundamentals of what makes music music, which is pleasing intervals and you know dragging energy through the entire piece. And I think he's really, really good at that. And they both and like, you can't lose the intensity at all, even if exactly. it's slow. Like, you Especially in Nimrod, if you slow on you yeah. slow down on that, it's like like yeah. it's slow. And if you slow down more, you're screwed. If you speed up a little bit, you're screwed. Like that's the mm-hmm. thing about slow. I don't like for non musicians. Like it, you would think like Almost the fast pieces are the hardest, 
but it's actually the slow pieces that are much harder because every mistake you made gets heard and it mm-hmm. can throw everybody off and it's just it's not it's not good yeah so yeah I mean, but, mr Corey wasn't a dancer in carnival so you know oh my god <laughs> i still remember that god a story a story he told us many times along with informing us about midway yes telling the story of midway um how he was in the amazon for a little while all those little stories Mm -hmm. were really what made mr io kind of so different like aside from how he was just an incredible conductor how he was like actually a (laughs) madman he he radiated chaotic energy how often did we have the foot the the street the race Oh my God! The race. <laughs> we would do the thing. We'd literally go out like, to the street. All of us, except for like maybe Kevin. Like, yeah. yeah, we would go out into the G- Gabe and John. For you, you didn't, probably never knew about that. Or I guess Gabe might have. But we would go to the at the Boca campus. Gabe, do you remember where the one of the drop off lanes like around? Like when you go in the in the front of the campus and you just go straight. Like that big yeah. hallway with the gym. Like much. that's where the gym is, I and that's where the ba- the band room and the orchestra room are right on that that yeah. exterior walkway so we would go out to the street and we would literally have a foot race and mr Ayala would just try and just just to see who would win and he he beat almost all of us <laughs> i think i think ryan's right I think it was just kevin but what like that was something we did more than once mm-hmm. <laughs> i think that was after band. my time because i don't really remember that but i mean yeah i don't remember that fourth grade for you guys probably at yeah, some I mean... I, we definitely i think we did it more than once so i think we did it in fourth grade and i think we did it a couple times hmm. i don't remember it's just yeah and how we would talk about how the safest place in the entire school was the lead was the closet the because the walls were super <laughs> thick because the all the walls were like made differently for the band room because for the sound yeah but oh, the wall yeah. the walls uh the campus the, wall. yeah the, the equipment like walls the wall outside the like the cubbies was like super thick for some reason and the doors were steel with no windows and he had wow. the only key wow. for them <laughs> so he was like if something goes wrong okay. we're going in that closet and we're going to be safe and we're like okay yeah i remember distinctly yeah. that time that the fort lauderdale kids came down and we were i, I don't remember what we were playing but it was something it was, something. It was like Pirates of the caribbean yeah, 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 probably. I think it was that. And then I remember, like, maybe two minutes into the rehearsal, he was conducting so hard that he, like, threw his um, baton. Did he like, snap it? Huh? <laughs> At some point, oh, he snapped yeah, I remember it. Like, <laughs> when he used, like, the flute cleaner or whatever. Yeah. He, he, like, hit it so hard against the stand, it broke. Yeah, he <laughs> snapped it in half. And was no, because like, if you, if you huh. looked at, like, his, like, his stand, it had, you know, the lip for the... Um, for the music but it had another sort of like other lip where you could keep like batons and pencils and yeah. the bottom lip was so nicked up it looked like it had like <laughs> receded from the other one it was ridiculous that's great yeah well, you gotta you gotta slap that thing pretty loud for the for the the lower, yeah. the lower school kids to hear you over there <laughs> they're blasting sorry yeah. huge tangents but mm-hmm. yeah no, like, i think like uh mr core i don't think he was He's he's a madman as well. I don't think he's like on that level, but like, um, the first thing like I think on the first day of orchestra this year, because he he was it was his first year being like the full orchestra conductor this year, and like, I think the first thing he did was start blasting Adele in the morning, and super loud, and we'd walk in, and he's like, guys, get pumped, like. It's eight in the morning. All of us are like dead, <laughs> <laughs> and he's yeah. just blasting like, um, yeah. "There's a fire starting in my heart," <laughs> and everyone's just like, "What is going on?" And then hyper relevant. He did this other days. Like he'd blast Billie Eilish. Like he's trying to he he blast Ocean Eyes. Like in the morning, all the girls Love are like it. singing at eight in the morning, and it's orchestra. And like some of the kids are also in theater and chorus as well, so like it actually sounds decent. Um, but and then um, and then another mad thing he did was um, I, I I think it's called Level Up. This pop song I, I haven't heard it on the radio or whatever. But um, we had to play scales to that, so he'd blast this pop song and we'd play like G major scale. To the well, like over the chords of the music. Yeah, over the. That's no, no, so no, funny. 
And then I think he played another rap song. He's like, okay, you have to play to this beat. And no, it's like the full on rap song. And we'd just be playing like da 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 da, like just scales to the beat. And like, I don't know, like, we've never had someone do that. I've never had someone do that with mm-hmm. me. And I was like, that's just like, and the thing about conductors is when they do something, and not crazy, but something that gains your respect, they don't lose it. Like, like I, I don't know, like for other conductors, like I know certain conductors, like you don't have respect for them and you can tell in their orchestra, like nothing happens. But like mm-hmm. for an orchestra that respects their conductor and it has to happen like in the first like minute they walk in the room. And once you get that respect, the orchestra will listen and do everything you say to as best as they can. And that's how you can tell if a conductor is good or not. And I think he tried to like, do these crazy things to like get us to play better because like um music is more it's not like it's also like emotional kind of and how you um mm-hmm. relate to your people you're playing with so like um this year we went to laser tag together like it, it had nothing orchestra related we didn't play music there wasn't a concert we just like he was like you know what uh i'm just gonna have like a dinner for you guys with like sushi and stuff and then i'm gonna pay for all of that and then i'm going to send you to laser tag and pompano it was like five ten minutes away from school and we were going to play dodgeball and we're going to play laser tag and we're just going to have fun and i, I think like violin that sounds <laughs> the <best. laughs> so like and, and it was funny because like it was a couple days before our concert or um uh, some mpa or something because it was supposed to be like a team building thing and it was like the funnest team building thing i've ever done but um and i think uh one of the violists, she uh, fractured her wrist, and two days before, and we mm. only have four or five violas, so you've already lost 20, 25 percent of that section, and <laughs> just to imagine 20, 25 percent of a four sec of a section when there's only four sec- sections, so you've lost one eighth of your orchestra right then. That's insane. In one person, and um. And it was so sad because it was scary for the violist and like she hit it really well. Um, and because she knew Mr. Corey would be impacted by it a lot. And because like this was his thing, like orchestra was his thing. And um, you lose 25 percent of one section like you're basic. You lose a lot of sound mm-hmm. and especially in a small orchestra. So she played she hid the pain and she played through it at the Jesus. concert and Mr. Corey did not know at all until like after the entire week ended wow. and it was just crazy because like that just goes to show how much respect he has from his players um so yeah um it it, it there's a lot of crazy things that we do and it, it's all a lot of fun yeah so something else that I wanted to touch on as well although I think you guys have mostly covered it was I was going to say like whether there was a specific project or teacher or initiative that sort of like fueled your passion or changed how you see things. I think, I think you guys have established that the teachers have a, a very strong impact there, but was there a specific piece that you, once you got playing sort of changed how you did things or something like that? For me, it was Paco Bell's Canon, even though it was super easy. It was in sixth grade. I was still not into um, violin at all. Um, I still hated it. Um, I was at North Broward. And, um, like, I don't know, I, I, I've been playing, uh, pieces that no one recognized because like my Russian teacher was like, um, very strict on learning classical, even though Paco Belkan is classical. Um, uh, and then I think the second piece that really impacted me was 1812 Overture. Mm. And that piece is really, it's a lot of fun to play, first of all. And second of all, whoever told you that, uh, classical music is boring uh, just listen to 1812 or- Overture, and the second you hear cannons fire, like actual cannons fire, I was gonna you, ask. You, can't, you can't tell me it's boring. Like, mm. There's like memes on Reddit and online saying like back in like the 1800s, like um, uh, Tchaikovsky's neighbor would be complaining because Tchaikovsky was practicing his cannon <laughs> at midnight. <laughs> but like, yeah, so like, I think that was another fun piece I played. And then I think Oh, the last piece that really impacted me um, or, like, helped me was Schindler's List. So, like, in ninth grade, we had to watch the movie for, like, 
um, Holocaust awareness and whatnot because our school yeah. has that. The and we watched thing. it. Yeah, we watched in their list, and I was like, "This is a really beautiful piece. Like, I, I want to learn how to play it." And I learned how to play it, and it was out of my level at the time. But like, I, I just like that was the only thing I played for like a month or two and I just got like really good at it. Um, well, I wouldn't say, well, yeah, I was really good at it for the level I was. I'm sure people could play it a lot better than I could, but, um, I played it for my audition into symphony orchestra at FYO. And, um, the first thing, there's a couple runs in that where you go down. That's, I wouldn't say tricky, but like when you nail it, it's so satisfying and at my audition, I nailed it. And my judge was like, wow, like I could tell you really practiced this piece and I couldn't stop smiling. And I was like, yeah. And I got into a symphony orchestra, so I passed my audition. And I think that piece, like even though it's like for a depressing movie or whatever, like it was such a powerful piece for me that it just made me realize that I could actually play my instrument if I really wanted to. And that was the same year I did pit orchestra. And I think 10th grade is when my violin skills peaked because like after that, I kind of had no time to do anything else, do violin and stuff. But like, like stuff like that and pit orchestra, Schindler's List, pit orchestra, like, that really helped me grow as a musician, just playing different stuff. Did you guys have any other impactful pieces for you? I know Nikhil wasn't here when we said the question, but that's what I was uh, Okay, so impactful pieces that change just how we, like, yeah. do. For me, probably, I played, there's a few. I've played, I played this concerto by Alexander Glazunov. I might have mentioned it earlier, last year. And it's this, I think it's a 10-page piece. I have it over there somewhere. Um, it's this 10-page piece that's split into three movements, kind of. And first of all, like, harmonically, it's probably one of the coolest pieces I've ever played because it, it'll it change to all 12 different keys in the most inventive ways I've ever seen. And playing it with the piano, because usually the way it works is in if you have a solo piece for an instrument like saxophone, trumpet, one of those wind instruments, you'll have a piano accompaniment because some of them are transcribed from older orchestral pieces. So they'll have like a piano company behind, a company behind it to simulate the orchestra. So in the, in the case of this, it was written for saxophone with a orchestral accompaniment. So it's a full orchestra behind you. So they had to reduce it down to a piano score. And learning about the way that this piece was written, because this is a lot of the um, Russian composers, Glazunov, Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky, they left Russia because of the political climate there. Obviously this was after the Bolshevik revolution. You have a lot of like political strife, a lot of censorship, stuff like that. And I think Glazunov is unique in the way that Stravinsky and Tchaikovsky were very unapologetic about how they left Russia. They were very like, this is my life now, I'm not Russian. And a lot of their music, obviously their music was very Slavic in its nature, but the way Glazunov used this technique called counterpoint was basically unknown before he really pioneered that use of counterpoint throughout orchestral melodies and his his use of very like good quotes of russian culture through the music really like drove home that point of like homesickness because especially the second movement of the piece it's this really really slow like reflective part of this piece where you're using like one of the one of the melodies used that really resonated with me was like you guys know the tetris thing the da 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 yeah. that that piece is a russian piece and that's yeah. quoted in this line that i'm playing during the second piece and it, listening to one of the best classical um players for saxophone his name is Branford, Branford marsalis when marsalis's brother He's talking about how Glazunov was writing this out of homesickness in a way. And I thought that really resonated with me. And it really like, I had, I had to learn the whole piece for my event, even though I had to cut it down after that. I learned it because I wanted to, and I memorized the whole thing. And I played it. I think that's the best I've played a classical piece because I really resonated with what the piece was trying to tra like tell me. 
and what I was trying to say through my instrument, which I think that's really special for a piece to do something to you like that. And I think that's something that more people should really look for and strive for is to find pieces that you're, you really like feel connected to it. And other pieces I've really felt influenced by basically anything by Charlie Parker, anything with that really pure bebop language where you're just, you're manipulating these scales and doing these chromatic turns that really like exemplify what it means to play bebop. And I love that stuff. And anything by Cannibal Adderley. He actually taught at a school down in Broward County, Dillard High, 60s, which is really cool. Actually, that school, mutual friends of mine, like, have gone to Juilliard from there. It's a really good program, but it's pretty cool. But yeah. Florida is a music powerhouse, and people don't really know that. It's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Like, for classical music, like, for pop music, like, Miami, yeah, but, like, classical music and other stuff, like, I think Florida has like that. I think Florida in general has been really influential to many styles. Like we have a lot of rappers that come down from like Fort Lauderdale, Broward area, Miami area. It's kind of crazy because like you hear stories of them, like, like, I don't know, like on the news and you're like, wait, shoot, I've been there. Like, yeah, like like, I've driven past that. XXX Tentacion is like buried 10 minutes from my house, which is like a really weird thought to me. (laughs) I never liked his music, but that's crazy rip, by the way. Yeah, and like it's like oh they're having his funeral or whatever at uh, the stadium in uh, Sawgrass, and I was like, yeah, I'm like, what? I drive by that like on a regular basis, like it's mm-hmm. crazy to me. But yeah, yeah, it's like it's Florida. Florida's weird. Like yeah. we're we're a real life GTA server, but like we're. Really- <laughs> <laughs> ooh, ooh, that one yeah, hurts. No, ooh. That one hurts, hurts my nose. nose, man. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but it's really funny no. because like a lot of jazz musicians also come down from here. Like they'll go to some crazy stuff. I was at Stanford for a music camp there and I was at this program and I had a private lesson with some guy. His name was Marcus Howell. Love him, by the way. He's a great guy. And he was like, oh, so where are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm from Fort Lauderdale. And he was like, you're kidding, right? And I'm like, no. And he's like, I'm from Deerfield. I went to Dillard. And he's this really, really high profile guy. And I had probably one of the coolest lessons I've ever had. And there's a lot of other people, like players, especially from Dillard. It's a really, really big powerhouse for these big players. Like Patrick Barkley came from there. And he's one of the most influential, like studio style musicians. He does a lot of gigs up in New York. He's played with like very high, prominent people. It's pretty crazy to see. Like, uh, if people don't know what Dillard is, Dillard is like um, this high school that's fine arts focused. Yeah. And they have like really talented people there. And I think they. They're like one of the only schools to have a theater just for their school. And it's like crazy. Um, Cause like, I mean, we have Stacy auditorium, but like they have like this theater just dedicated to their theater kids. And it's like, I think it's crazy that mm-hmm. a high school, especially, I think it's public, right? Or charter. Yeah, it is. It's a magnet school. And it's, it's yeah. really important. Yeah. It's like a, a public more. school. Yeah. And uh, like it, it's, it's, education in the fine arts is like unparalleled in South Florida and it's crazy that it's a public school and yeah it's like one of those hidden gems that no one really knows about and yeah. a lot of a lot of talented people come out of that school um so yeah here's something else that I think is also um interesting to talk about and this is actually something that's been a bit of a recurring theme in a lot of these episodes is that we'll talk to somebody that's that works in like one department or does this one thing um and they'll say there's all these talented people in other departments and I might not necessarily work with them very much, but if we did, we could do some really interesting stuff together. How much do you think that applies either within like the music department? Like how much do you guys work between whether it be chorus or band or orchestra or whatever uh, with each other? And how much do you think that applies with other things? Like for example, theater or things like that. Do you, do you think that there's a lot of um, interdepartment work in that way? And what would you like to see in that department? I wish I'm Chris, not really, not really. It's lacking. Yeah, best, we could do better. The most fun I've had in band was when it wasn't actually with band at all, but was when we did Star Trek with the Thalors. Yeah. And I really wish we had more like actual combined performances like that, not like, you know, the combined performances in like the upper school. Oh, yeah. That was so like bad. one giant song that's really easy, like an yeah. actual yeah. challenging piece that we have to work on together. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't really know. It's a compensation circumstance every year. <laughs> 
<laughs> Probably. Yes. No, and like O to we played O to Joy, but like a toned yeah. down version of it. We no, because I remember I had I had two pages of just whole notes, and me yeah. and like the rest of the section we were just like, no, we're not doing this. We played so, Opportuna, and it was that a was toned it. down version of it as well. It was the one I was trying chorus. to remember. I think chorus people was singing like the actual thing, but like orchestra was so boring. Like I. I I could have yeah. played that. I wouldn't say I could have played that in my sleep, but I probably nearly could have played it in my sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like I think pit orchestra is like the highlight of it was the best. Third depart- it's the best. It's um, it's like thirty people crammed in this tiny box <laughs> under stage. It's for literally this hours. Year, the every ventil- night. Yeah, this vent this year the ventilation was great, but Kiss Me Kate, like too darn hot. I'm wearing the shirt right now, but like it was too <laughs> darn hot in the pit. Like I think. We were sweating in there. Someone didn't wear deodorant. We yelled at them. Um, and then, um, and can it, you quickly and just like, explain what pit orchestra is for people that might okay? Know. So, so everyone knows the musical. They start. Um, they start. They rehearse like two, three months in advance, right? Like they, they, they go at it. Yeah. They're and they're really good at what they do. Um, and the, to accompany them, we have the pit orchestra, which is uh, I think it's usually around five or six strings players. Uh, around 10 um, band players and then a pianist and a drum set jerry morris this year was great i think we had um, eight this year from band we had, we had eight from band okay eight. and then we have some teachers yeah. play with us so i had mrs as far as if on cello we had mr finn he was there mr. right finn clarinet and then dr francis on trumpet it was dr francis and, another cat from miami i don't okay. forget his name oh, yeah um, there's another guy they, they were on trumpet and like Pinecrest has like really qualified musicians, like as teachers. Yeah, and when Dr. they Francis play, amazing. They play, like they play, and it's and to be in the same room as them, hearing them play, it's like beautiful. And then, so like you have twenty or so, thirty or so people crammed in this tiny box under stage. So like, um, Gabe, you know how on stage there's this, there's this curve in the front, yeah, of the stage and a straight line right after that. It's like a semicircle. Yeah. 30 people feet fit under that. That rectangle in the back is all just stage. And then that little semicircle mm-hmm. in the front is pit. And it's it's tiny. Um, thankfully, we had fans this year. And they put the AC down for us, yeah, for everyone. Was, which was I couldn't so imagine nice. it like that. So nice of them. Um, and um, basically, we get the music a month in advance, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was about a month. And, and the... For Kiss, for okay, for this year, Meet Me in St. Louis, the book was much thinner than Kiss Me Kate. Kiss Me Kate, it was like that thick. Ooh. Um, it was like it was a, it was a good few. I think it was a hundred. It was like at least a hundred pages. I would say two hundred, probably a little more than two hundred pages. But you had to learn all that in a month and get it performance ready. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. If if for people who don't know to get like a single piece like even a one page piece concert ready takes for an orchestra that size probably takes two months maybe a month of solid practice and then we had to do that in three or four weeks like hundred like a few a hundred more than a hundred pages and like i think we all bonded I wouldn't call it suffering, but it kind of was suffering. But we all bonded in that suffering together. Like, okay, the past, the, was, the last like two hours of like those all day rehearsals, those got really rough. Yeah. Like, that was like, like my mouth was numb, kind of rough. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you know, but on the December, on when we were doing performance, I had a robotics competition at Pinecrest. From oh, yeah. 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then at 6 o'clock was call time. For pit orchestra to play until 10. What was that? Was that that Friday? That that was Saturday. That was Saturday matinee. And, <sighs> not matinee. Night performance. And I was so dead. And yeah. I, I fucking love Jeremy for this. He brought me Chick-fil-A in between. Oh my God. Love that and kid. I, he, I love that kid. And I was like, I was famished. I was tired. And he brought me Chick-fil-A. And it was like the best Chick-fil-A I've ever had. Because I was so tired. But um, yeah, we had... Um, we had... So it's basically the theater kids perform on top, and they're also great. And I, it's it's rare for orchestra high school orchestra players to play with theater like singers and theater kids at that level. Um, 
and I think we were having like a mini party under stage while they're playing. It was so much yeah, fun. Was, um, <laughs> like during the, um, like their solo acts, we'd just be like Millie rocking. Yeah, we'd be like, we, so like we'd be playing rock paper scissors or <laughs> the orchestra. Um, I remember like, I got I, I got my acceptance letter to Indiana while we were doing a practice, and I was just like on my phone. We were just like waiting for like a call to start, and I was yeah. like, oh okay, <laughs> we just started playing. It was then, the funniest thing. And then like um and then like we, uh, they brought us cupcakes and las Spadas, and we were like dining down there as well. We yeah, kept we it had nice a and neat, feast, bro. We had a feast down there, um, and it and we had and then so yeah we di- we do that and um we get we don't really it's funny because we play the show but we have no idea what's going on on stage. Oh my god, yeah, but I we, still don't know the storyline to that. I don't know what the storyline like. I I hear. Like I, I just focus on my part. I play my part, and I enjoy what we have. And we sometimes sing along to the songs. No, because I, I like I'll like talk along to the music when we're like yeah. waiting for that one line. Yeah. It's like when and 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 then you go in. Like, yeah. on the and then I'm um, down in the jungle, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we're all like dancing around yeah. like, little children under the stage, and it's so yeah, much. I remember fun. I do a baseline for that. I love that song. That song was so adorable, and yeah. It, it, it's it's overall a very fun experience mm-hmm. it's draining and it's tiring there's a lot of work to it but it's a lot of fun and it's worth it no. so, and you get 40 community service hours for it gas. because we're not Absolute in the cast and we're <laughs> we're volunteering our time for it and we get food and stuff it's like the best thing i've ever done mm-hmm. so, yeah my favorite part was i had to play i was playing so there's a there's a few different kinds of saxophones i play alto personally but i was playing tenor and baritone sax for those for that whole thing and i really enjoyed because i had to transpose half the music because it was written for it was written for bass clarinet and bassoon and clarinet so i was transposing from c to b flat and it was the funniest thing because the first few rehearsals i was just like what was happening and i had to like write in different key signatures it was it was wild but i had so much fun with it barry's probably one of my favorite instruments to play because it's just like so chonky. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how different that is for things like chorus, man. Maybe you can speak to that. But like, how much do you guys work with like other departments or productions like that? Uh, it's, I mean, the musical is a lot of chorus people. Some amount of them who also do drama and some amount who don't, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I never really got involved because I was, I probably would have had I been there longer, but I just it didn't, didn't have the time and other things um i don't know i i I mean the what we do one performance one or two times like songs the super easy songs you're talking about earlier with the whole with everyone you know the one time or two times and it's like eh. i feel like that 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 performance could have a lot more potential if we played something harder Mm -hmm. Um, but then it's a time thing as well because scheduling that scheduling rehearsals for that would be like really hard i think that's everyone just like does. a problem with how we rehearse is like especially in band so we don't have time to do like by the time we get to a concert we'll we'll know maybe 50 percent of the piece yeah like everything to comes point where like, together on stage literally. no it got to the point where we play the first like the second or third page of the music a day before the concert for the first time it's yeah. like ridiculous and yeah, there were quite a few people who just really phoned it in constantly which yeah. slows you kind of mucks everything up you know you're trying to get someone to learn something and they don't care enough to learn it and but you need that's them the to thing know it. right because I, so. I wanted to i was talking to our band director jamie roth like maybe junior year about just like doing an honors band where it's like you elect to do this you practice the music it'll be like more of a chamber ensemble yeah. and i was like yeah we'll do that we didn't end up doing it and i got we obviously suffered for it because we got what will we get this year goods I don't remember. I think we managed to scrape out excellence somehow. No, we got an overall excellent because we did superior sight reading and then goods for. It was. Yeah, it was yeah, not <laughs> Chorus only did one step better. Like in one of the three, we got one grade better. And I think that pushed us slightly higher, but it was not. Everyone was like, we did better than band. I'm like. Not I mean, really. I just think I think the chorus <laughs> program is just unequivocally better than the band, though. The course um, program at our school is really good, just it, hands down. They've there's got a, lot, a people, lot. I think there are more people who care more. Yeah. And yeah and the people who care more course. can outshine the people who don't. 
the people who don't can just be they literally quieter. have a larger voice. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Sess is just great. I love it's him. The difference between having like four parts and having like you know sixteen. A lot. Yeah. There's a lot more things that need to be covered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And at most people eight parts. Yeah. Because some, like, sometimes the voice is split. I mean, yeah, bass is almost like, always split, so it's pretty much, something. pretty much five parts. Yeah. But, but yeah. In orchestra, we had honors orchestra. Um, they they keep change. College counseling keeps changing the name to make yeah. it look better on our resumes and what. I think it's BS. But um, so like it's called select string ensemble now. And last year we had um, so last year we had to show up to what seven thirty and practice like every other like on odd days so monday wednesday friday yeah. um and then they stopped that and they stopped that so- my sophomore year and then my junior year they just did tuesday thursdays select kids leave normal orchestra and practice their piece um yeah. and we need less practice time for harder pieces because like we practice at home and stuff so we, we got the pieces down but what happened was that since all the the good people were leaving the normal orchestra that on those days that we left the regular orchestra didn't have like a foundation to play off of so they didn't know what they were doing and that caused us honors orchestra kids to perform at mpas and get a superior but it caused the normal orchestra even with us there because we had to play both parts we had to learn both parts and perform in both but um since they didn't know the parts. The we got an excellent, like a low excellent. No, I think we got a high excellent, but we didn't do as well as we could. So this year, um, we didn't have an we didn't have an honors orchestra. So um, we auditioned to be in honors orchestra, but we didn't have our own select rehearsal time for it. Um, we were just put in a different grading category, and we only we played um, normal orchestra parts, and we only like five days a week instead of three days a week um so we were there every day for every practice and with course kids leaving as well we have that as well um yeah. those people get less experience time as well um so uh, so what they did this year is they we don't have normal rehearsals for honors kids and um we all play together in the same orchestra but we have certain pieces like a flat or like um odyssey that um, the honors kids learn like outside of school and then we play at school like probably once a month with the rest of the orchestra and then we perform it by ourselves at concert. So there's less time of us leaving the orchestra body. So um, and then at MPAs, we don't have we, they, we used to have two MPAs, normal orchestra and honors orchestra and the honors orchestra kids would play in both. So we'd be there the, the entire day. But this year we didn't have the honors orchestra competition we just played at um the regular orchestra competition and we got superior so i guess their strategy of just um having everyone play without having us split apart worked um so that so we don't really have an honors orchestra really anymore it's sort of like a pseudo honors orchestra really but yeah i i feel like i think um mr Corey said that honestly that there should be two orchestras or like two bands or something. And I think that'd be cool. Like if instead of having, instead of having like band and orchestra, maybe we just have like a normal full orchestra at Pinecrest. I think people would be into that. And like, um, and maybe, I I don't know how scheduling would work because that's area of expertise. Like maybe we could have two periods instead of one period for orchestra. I know like comp sci has like five, like it's like an old class, but, for some reason, it's still considered an elective. Right. Is comp still considered an elective? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's, not, so. it's not core curriculum. Right. Yeah. So, so yes. Like, does maybe, it count towards like, your core GPA? Because it's an AP. It yeah. Oh, right, right. Oh, okay. That's All APs count towards little. core. Okay. So, um, like, orchestra, like, we could have, like, a normal orchestra with, like, and then you audition for the honors orchestra. Is The honors orchestra is a full orchestra. And I think a lot of people would get behind that. And mm-hmm. we'd probably, we would probably wouldn't have first period or something. We'd have another period for it. But then again, the mu- music teachers also teach middle school and lower school. So it's it, scheduling wise, it'd be a little complicated, but I think it'd be an interesting thing to do. The, the scheduling yeah. web is like a nightmare. It's, it's yeah. such a nightmare. Like impossible to navigate. Because um, everyone's an like, athlete, you can't do yeah. 
you can't do after school rehearsals because half the orchestra is also really good at sports. So then they're gone after school. Mm -hmm. and then, it's like, practically impossible to do before school because half the yeah. half the population lives 45 minutes away yeah <laughs> uh, that's, that's the problem we have with jazz band because every like yeah. i would end up coming late a lot of the time because you hit 95 traffic and then it's just like ridiculous. and then yeah and then we've got swimmers as well who go to school at six True. in the morning and swim until eight then at four o'clock they swim until six and they swim Dude, i can never they're, imagine doing that they're crazy like crew and um crew and swimming are literally cults yeah like not, they're stupid. literally cults yeah. like, i thought cross country was bad but <laughs> cross country is also a cult like they're also really good at what they do um yeah like crew they come in at like six o'clock seven o'clock in the morning on saturdays and row until that. 10 that's what we did that's what we did for like morning practice on saturdays but we don't do like any everyday morning practice i i'd kill myself if i did that like I like t like robotics kids like you, you could say I'm in there four to six every day after school and then like on Saturdays I come in at ten to two, but like waking That's up still at pretty six, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. But like waking up at five o'clock to go to school to row a boat, like that's a that's next level. Like I, I I couldn't do that, and swimming as well. The swimmers go to practice at six in the morning as well, and which is why they're like state champs this year. So. I mean, like, there's a lot of good people who are great at other things who are also in the music program. So scheduling yeah. stuff would just be a nightmare, which is probably why they don't do it. So, yeah. but it also like, it just the amount of stuff we have, like TSA clubs, like clubs are basically like secondary or not tertiary priorities. Like they're not even prime; they're nowhere near primary priorities. Yeah. And it's so hard to hold a club meeting because everyone else is doing everything that they could imagine that scheduling is just impossible so mm -hmm. i do think you've brought up some interesting points though which i think are very worth talking about which is like you guys have been involved in a lot of different programs uh whether in music or otherwise but from what you've seen and what you've experienced what do you think the the current state of the programs are what do you think are the the pros what do they do very well what would you like to see uh what do you think it's heading in the future stuff like that Take funding away from the football team. Just kidding. Don't Absolutely, do please. <laughs> I don't want another year of us going four and twelve. No, like okay. So I don't know if it's true, but I'm pretty sure it's true. They get the most funding out of all the athletic departments, right? Absolutely. They have that blow up helmet. That's probably a couple grand. Yeah, they no, they have like these radio helmet. controlled like dummies that move around the. It's ridiculous. And they, and, and they yeah. use and they and they use and they and they like they take a lot of money. Um, and like, I mean, I don't know, like we, the only person I know on the football team is good at what he does is Graham. Cause he's a great mm -hmm. kicker. Yeah. I think he kicks from 50 yards now, but, um, he's in my math class. Um, he's so stupid like good. he's stupid good at, he's stupid good at, yeah, he's in Ryan and I were in the same math class today. Like, um, but, um, he, like we have so many good programs and the football I think the football team gets a lot of money. And I think the cross country team, the volleyball team is also good, but like yeah. they don't get a lot of funding as well. Um, the crew team obviously gets a lot of funding, but I think like, but they're really good. Uh, yeah. So I don't know where I was going with this. Wait, Gabe, what were you saying? Like, I don't know. So like, about, like the current state of like your guys' programs, like whether it be like chorus or other and, music things, um, like, uh, like where do you think it is? Like, Sorry, Kirk. I'm not sure if this is like a music in general thing or if it's just like our band, but it's falling apart because people don't care anymore. Yeah. Like, yeah. If they have I other sports, other activities they care about more, or if it's just like people aren't interested in playing classical music, which I'm sure is somewhat relevant as we get further and further away from that time period. Like, no, people don't want to play, don't want to be in band. They'll be there because their parents say so, because, you know, sunk cost fallacy, all that stuff. But, like, most of the people who come into band either quit after freshman year because they don't have to stay or yeah. stay and are miserable. And then there's a few yeah. who are actually good who continue because they enjoy it. And even they're struggling through it now. Yeah. Like, Nikhil, I know you are having a rough time in band this year. Yeah, I don't think any of us seniors were having a good time in band. It was not good for all of us. I think I think that a lot, you know, you, everyone's entitled to their own opinions on the matter, obviously. I think a lot of 
the trouble comes from people being not cooperative. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people, those people that Ryan's talking about, are the people who don't care, who don't want to be there, make so it why impossible. Are you there? Right, you can, you can't asleep. you can't cater well to a group of people of the people who really want to be there and people who, you know, hate it. You can't. It's difficult to do the same thing to both of them and make both happy. And you yeah. have to do and you have to include both. You know, in the case of in you know with a school program, you you both have to be included, even though maybe one group shouldn't be. So, I don't know. I think there's at least some some blame to be put at the the feet of the people who are who are obstinately there but complain about it every day mm-hmm. which is yeah, frankly one of the most frustrating things years, yeah it's one of the most frustrating like. things in the universe for me which is just people who are there who complain and do nothing about it and, and just think- sit there and complain and that, i understand right. there's some things people can't change yeah i understand i understand that there are cases and situations circumstances etc that lead to someone not being able to go or their complaints not being fixed despite efforts. I understand mm-hmm. that. But I'm saying the like the people who just complain, who don't like it, who don't want to be there, who don't have to be there, but They're stay. still there. Yeah. I don't get it. Just leave Personally. the doors right there. Yeah. Either there, leave or or try and or mm-hmm. find some enjoyment out of it. Whatever it is, even if it's not the cut and dry intended purpose find your find a way to enjoy it that's the way you make life yeah. enjoyable is you find some part of it that you enjoy and you cling to it and it, and it, and i'm and i think like um i don't in orchestra it's like cut it's like um your people who are in the program have been doing it for years and like um some people like um they find another passion that they want to do and like even scheduling conflicts at Pinecrest, like just your normal schedule. Like this year, I didn't have a lunch. Um, a lot of people are like doing comp sci, and they're like comp sci or like a, a bunch of other electives, and they're like maybe I should quit orchestra and because like so I can take other AP classes. And mm-hmm. I'm like, and well, the first thing I say to them is like, well, do you get anything out of orchestra? Do you or- enjoy it? And do you really want to do this other class? And if they want to then like, sure, go ahead, take that class instead of orchestra. And I'm like, and it's like, um, if like, I'm not saying, yeah, orchestra isn't for everyone. Like, well, anything isn't for everyone, period. So, um, like if you, if you find something else you want to do, then just go for it. I mean, we're, we're coming from a musician standpoint and we're saying it's great and it's worth it. But like maybe like you find something else that gives you fulfillment, then you should do that if you don't want to be stuck in an orchestra room for 45 minutes every morning or a band room for 45 minutes every morning. Like if you, it's voluntary, you don't have to be there. If you're here, it's great. But if you don't want to be here, then it's not as great as it can be. So, yeah. If you, if you don't want to be there, I can guarantee you there are other people in the room who don't want you there either. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That is true. I count myself among them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say yeah. it. I'll put my. I'll. Put, I'll take that hot take. If you don't want to be there, I agree. Leave. So, what would you guys say is the the future then? Like, how do you make these programs more prestigious, or maybe more selective, or more interesting? I mean, you guys I talked th- about maybe combining some of them to make like a big orchestra, for example, a full orchestra instead. But do you guys have any other ideas on things like that? I mean, th- what I all I can. All I can say is the my idea, and you know, obviously it doesn't work because I don't know the logistics, I don't know the circumstances, etc., of it being a class. But Gabe, I'd say the same thing I said to the to us when we started video game this year with TSA, which is if you want to be here, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this right. So if you're along, if you want to be along for that ride, you're welcome. Please join us. But if you're not on board and you're gonna be, you're gonna get in the way, you know, if you're gonna you're gonna hinder it. Please, you know, we could, we're perfectly happy. We're perfectly okay with you not being there or just watching, and then you'll come back later if you're still interested. If you find out you you know you're not like you're not totally sold, you can come and then leave. You know, it, it doesn't. I don't think. I think that needs to be the environment. Is that it's a it's it should be an environment for people who want to be there, who want to learn about it. Even you could even. I mean, it's. I don't know how it would work with a class, but if people just wanted to observe for some period of time, say if like someone wanted to join them but wasn't sure, instead of being like, I'm going to do this for a year, like in the ad drop period, they could just like come and sit that, yeah, in. That, yeah, exactly. Or it's something like, two, like that. It's a two-week ad, 
You have two weeks to add drop, right? It's yeah. like it's like Plus. three or a month. It's actually longer. Is that something oh, okay. that I yeah. think? Something I think is interesting that I've noticed, at least from talking to a lot of these different groups of people, um, is that a lot of people would be interested in seeing how their department is like showcased, uh, be different in the future. For example, um, you guys have performances, and we can see what you guys yeah. do. But I have never seen a PCTV 20 minute special where they go in depth in the back scenes, like behind the scenes, for example, on like how you guys do everything you do, like some of the success stories or some of the failures or people who um, have like risen through the ranks, something like this podcast, even uh, I've never seen before sort of showing um, all these things behind the scenes and having that air for Pinecrow sort of thing, for example, would be really interesting to show people a bit how it works behind um, the, the example was also given for film um, for the film people if they make a, a film, it doesn't get shown to Pinecrest ever. Like, it, it, PCTV yeah. doesn't air it because all the shows are, sl- are short now. Um, so there's a lot less, I think, I think the public perception of a lot of these departments and a lot of these programs is very different from what it's like to actually be inside of them. Um, so we I don't know have if you guys so have much an easy video idea content. There, but... it's a I mean, like, we have home. so much video content. Like, and, like, we could just put it on YouTube. I don't know why you use Vimeo. I don't like Vimeo. You Vimeo's can't search awful. anything. It's such a it's a terrible platform. Sorry, Vimeo. And if Pine Chris, you get sued over this, I'm sorry for that. Not really, but <laughs> we assume no responsibility. I we, I'm we pretty assume. sure Pine, Pine Chris is not in affiliation with Vimeo. I don't think it's like a partner. So why do we still? We're use also it? neither affiliated with Pine Chris <laughs> nor um, Vimeo. Correct. No, we, we're yeah. we, we're alumni now. Hashtag you know how annoying ad. it is to get back on campus as an alumni. It's so annoying. If you guys don't want us, then don't get mad at what we say. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think it has anything to do with wanting us or not. They hide him as Saunders. <laughs> and then like, what if no, doctor I, thinks she's leaving? Right, right now, like, in order to be on campus, you have to be with a teacher at all times as an alumni. Like, I literally was at your school a year ago. I graduated, and <laughs> yeah. now I need, a, I need a chaperone. I guess we're doing group tours. Sign up for one of the time slots. Dad, at school, I would have done it while I was a student. That's... Yeah. And, especially, and it especially sucks for us because, like, our senior year got cut short in half. Like our second semester got cut in half. So like we couldn't like be on campus yeah, for like the last. We, yeah, yeah, we didn't. No, we didn't even get to say goodbye to anyone. We didn't see anybody. And now I'm thinking like if I want to go back next year, I have to call security and get my security clearance. Yeah. That's not different like, than no, what I, it is now. I mean, you're. I mean, I don't know. No, but no, like I get getting a security clearance, but like um, in order to like be on campus. Like you have to email a teacher, they have to email security and say, this student will be by my side from this time slot to this time slot. Is that Which new under- as of this year? That That's new as of this year. It was like year. this year or last year, I think. Well, because I've, I've definitely after, seen that not past, the case. Like, well, that it was getting close after to the Douglas, holiday, like they got like a lot. Packs of, packs of recent graduates were like come, going around seeing all their favorite teachers again. And that was like really fun, seeing all those people that you remember. Yeah. And, but n- but now you, you can't you can't roam around yeah. campus seeing teachers anymore. You have to be yeah. with a certain teacher from a certain time period, which I, I mean, think I do understand it totally why they did it this way. It's, yeah, yeah, it makes sense, but it's just still like kind of it totally defeats the purpose of visiting your high school. Period. Yeah. So mm. yeah, and, and and it's not like Pinecrest is slacking on security. Like we have so much security. Like mm-hmm. I think like I think like everybody gets like a background check to work at a school i think at every school mm-hmm. but like we have like a fence we have yep. like two armed cops on campus at all times and it's not like our school is bit well it's big but like it's pretty small relative to other high schools i've been to just on land mass um because it's a pretty small school there's 200 kids in high school no 200 kids in each grade in high school so there's 800 like, kids i like, think it's D- like a th- douglas I think a thousand, Douglas I think, has like fourteen. Yeah. Like Douglas has a couple thousand. Like they're basic. They're like huge. Um, but like, I think like yeah, and it, it's kind of annoying to have to do it. But I understand like from a security um, perspective. But there, there's a certain time or a line where it's not like it's you're just operating on fear now, kind of. If you know what I'm saying. Welcome to but, the present. Yeah. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, so without, uh, without going too off topic onto almost a political podcast, Tangent. which multiple people <laughs> have suggested I do, and I am terrified to set foot. No, in. yeah, that um, would be. <laughs> how about no? That would that would be uh, interesting. It would be like party for common ground. <laughs> I have been 
ta- I mul- multiple people from, from Party from Common Ground have talked to me, and it's kind of terrifying. Anyway, no. Common Ground um, was fun. Doesn't someone just get hold of Frank. He'll just set it up. He'll yeah, do it. Yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? You think he won't do it? I am 100% sure there's people <laughs> who come on. Are you kidding me? The, pol- the politics people are the ones that would like to talk. No, I'm saying I bet Frank would like make his own podcast. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, he'd be like, party for common ground online. It's the e-party. <laughs> uh, but I do want to bring it back to one more thing. I feel like at this point we've kind of looked over like the whole story. We, we talked about where you guys started. We talked about where you went from there the first few years. We talked about... Uh, where we are now and where we sort of see it going in the future. So the question is, now that we're kind of looking back at the whole story uh, and we can reflect on it a bit, are there any, are there any things, are there things that you think need to be said that aren't said enough? It could be shout outs to people that were really impactful to you. It could be people that are coming up. It could be people that are coming up that you think are going to be really important (laughs) in the future. It could be like certain things that are like not talked about in the program that everybody knows or things like that. I'm tired of having stands that sink while I'm playing. <laughs> Just tighten the nuts. It takes 10 seconds, please. No, but it's, it's a... the slider ones. It's not the one with the Oh, nuts. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's what I'm and saying. The, like... and the... Yeah. I, th- and I, think I, just go... I think what I was saying before, like... <laughs> if, even if it's not in an official capacity, I think it's it stands to... I feel like it makes sense that if you are interested, absolutely try it. If you don't like it, you you will you will thank yourself, and other people will thank you if you if you move along and you know if you if you're not if it's not your thing if you discover you it's don't like, like it. You're also in high school. I mean, like this is the time to try things. A lot yeah. of things. And there's like, no. There's no. Sh- not, there's, yeah. There's no shame in trying something and going, I don't like this, and stopping. Yeah. There, really, yeah. there isn't. It, everyone feels like they have think, to like pick pick something that they're going to do. And it's just like And there everyone's like, Oh no, I'm quitting and everyone's like quitting is bad. Well like quitting if like you're quitting because you give up is bad, but quitting because uh you you want to pursue something else, like that's fine. Yeah. I mean like or it's it, not it, forever. And especially in a team setting, which these types of things are, if you're not if you don't again if you don't want to be there it's detracting from everyone else's experience as well mm-hmm. so it's not just a matter of i'm qu- I, i've decided to quit it's not like you failed it's like well you're doing you're doing something good for the for your te- for the people who are interested and stuff like that yeah. it, imp- it improves your quality of life presumably but it will also improve their experience in the in the thing and it's like if you hate this thing, but you love something else, why are you still doing the thing you hate? It just doesn't make sense. So, I don't know. But, the thing yeah, I feel outs. like it's... Sorry, you Mr. Corey. Shout things, out Mr. But, uh... Ross, shout out Mr. Finn, shout out Brandon Goldberg, that kid's going to go far. Um, <laughs> Mr. Shapiro. Shout out Mr. Shapiro, shout out Mr. Corey, shout out Mr. Abreu. Who else? Um, the teachers. Shout out Dr. Francis. <laughs> Shout out oh, Mr. Mr. Yeah, just the teachers, oh, period. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but presuming they see this. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, how many views mom. have you gotten so yeah. far? Thank you to my think? mom and dad no. for forcing me to uh, pursue violin and then um, getting scared when I said I liked it because they didn't want me to be a music major. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should I should also I should add a footnote to my other statement, which is that there is something to be said about trying something, sticking with something, and developing a love for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that there's a fine line between sticking with it until you like developing a love for something and just staying in the mud. Yeah, yeah. and so when you're sticking I, with it, you're still trying. Like you're open minded yeah. that you might learn from it or get better or not. Like no, but so, I think if what we're trying to just say, if you have to, then there's a point yeah. where you just need to be like, I gotta walk away. I think there's, I think what we're trying to say is like, if you immediate, like it takes time to start liking it. Cause I think we all come from that. But like to the one, when, when like, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I personally, when I didn't like something, I didn't like stay there and try and detract from other people. Like I tried hard enough that, um, cause I think there's kind of this, so- well, at least for me, there's a social pressure of not knowing your part, even if you didn't like playing it. Like mm-hmm. I was like so scared of screwing up. Like, even as a third violin, because, like, at Florida Youth Orchestra, 
I worked my way up from the back. So I was like third violin, then I was second violin, I was first violin, and then I was concert master. So like I played in all the sections of that orchestra. Like I know for certain, like um, there's a difference, like Matt said, between like doing something and hating it and then developing a love for it or doing something, hating it, still hating it and staying there and ruining the experience for everyone else. I think like if you're going to not like something, at least put in effort, like put in the minimum effort so that other people don't suffer from you hating it. Just keep the hate to yourself. Yeah, Or go not like it with other people who don't like it. Don't not like it with people who like it. (laughs) Shout out Mr. Testa, Mr. Zillow. I forgot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mr. Evers. And if we're talking fine arts people, shout out to Miss C, um, the dance teacher. A lot of help during the multi-performance. And Miss Boyd. Yeah, uh, people, oh. all, all the teachers you all know who you are anyone who works <laughs> at Pinecrest Fine Arts you guys are great yeah <laughs> no so. I, I also would encourage I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm backpedaling but I'm really trying not to it's just a separate thought I had which is yeah, that if so. you have the inkling you want to try something do and do it. find seek out a way to try it instead of just going well I can't it's why I wasn't in chorus for all four years of high school. And I, and I read it. I'd rather have done mm-hmm. it for twice as long. I would have had a blast the whole time, I'm sure. But, you know, I just didn't know that because they're at the same time, you could do both if you stagger the days. Makes yeah. perfect sense. They already had a system. People were doing it. Apparently, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> so oh. if you want to try something, especially in music, try it you know go out or at least go observe it and see if you want to try it you know take steps don't just sit idly and go and that would probably be cool and there's like a learning curve too so don't expect to be good at it immediately like like what i said earlier in the podcast like when i started playing violin i started sounding like nails on chalkboard mm-hmm. like it was awful like i i don't know why, I did more why speaking I... and playing my first week yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. like if you want to like hear something worse than nails on chalkboard try listening to me in like second grade trying to play twinkle twinkle not knowing how much pressure to apply to the bow and hearing like like a cat screaming every five seconds (laughs) and i don't know how my parents like bared with me like they're the same people who are experiencing this audio torture are the same people who are forcing me to go into this violin class so like i don't know (laughs) There's, there's a reason I didn't bring my instrument home for so long. Yeah. I, I just don't practice at home. I always practice at school. I always practice. Like, the only time I brought it home was or something. the one time They're I brought it home that. that I didn't have to absolutely by like means of having to record something was before uh, a pandemic started. <laughs> just in case. It really did take your Reasonable. coronavirus to... And, um, yeah. it's, it's over there. Home. <laughs> but Mr. So, Roth ended up driving by and delivering it. Yeah. Did he really? T- yeah, Mr. Roth dropped off the... people's instruments well, of at their house. That's sick. Good for him. Yeah. yeah. He lives nearby. So, I also can I can also definitely this is a small tangent. I can I can say for certain I've never enjoyed practicing my instrument so much than the day I sat down and I'm like, I need to prepare for this piece. And I played Avengers for four hours. Yeah. And I was just like rocking out the whole time. I'm like, Yeah, I can deal with this. Mm-hmm. Like that that was me with like I think Star Wars and then like um you know the song Rather Be by Queen Bandit? Like da 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 da. I think I spent like an hour just playing that jump because it jumps. And I'm I'm not even sure if there's a real string player playing that behind it or not, mm-hmm. or maybe they just used it and like they use strings on like, uh, on like Garage Band or some I don't know whatever yeah, yeah. audio thing they use. Um, studio. Like yeah, yeah. And then I was like, okay, Able let me thing. let me learn this this jump thing so I can show off to my friends later. Down the like I think that's the thing with band. Like when I was shadowing band, like people were playing like like mean music yeah <laughs> then, oh yeah randomly Fortnite had, dance. <laughs> in my flip book for pep band i had a copy of um oh man what's this all? we are number one yeah. yeah one that found a trombone quartet <laughs> version of that mm-hmm. and i had one of the parts in there we never played it we like, did it mario for our quartet in the sax section oh, and you and uh That's you amazing. you and your your sax gang played uh, the wii theme for oh, playing yeah. for change that was yeah, so we did, great we did that we did thomas the train one year thomas, yeah <laughs> we did what else did we do um nice. i sure remember this i was there wasn't i yeah. <laughs> we did, okay, so we did the Wii theme we did thomas the tank engine we did um 
was it Tetris? No, it wasn't Tetris. Playing for Change is always awesome. I wish I could have gone to those. Best event at, Pine at Pinecrest. Seriously. They didn't live so stream fun. it this year. This year I had some business to take care for care of after school and I was gonna watch it in the car live stream it, but they just didn't live stream it. Yeah. That was so sad. Um they yeah. usually live stream it. Like um I think Gabe was saying earlier, like um like with the video recording and stuff, we have so much content. Like we just put yeah. it all on YouTube and I think people would watch it. Um For sure. Like even like like I PC TV live covers sports games, but they don't save the video. I don't think they save the video. They live stream it though. And then like the behind the scenes of like the pit and whatnot. Like, um, it's funny cause like nobody, everybody who wasn't in my classes when I was wearing the musical shirt, they're like, you're in the musical. I was like, no, I'm in pit orchestra. And they're like, oh, like they didn't think there was no, there was a pit orchestra at all, yeah. which is funny. Cause like, like some people came after me and like, why are you wearing the shirt? Like you're not, I didn't see you on stage. I was like, oh, I'm in the pit orchestra. And they're like, wait, what? I thought it was a recording, which yeah. is like a great compliment, but it was like, but like it's we funny because there. there's a head sticking out of the stage. You'd think yeah. they're like, <laughs> conducting. <laughs> like they added the two together. They're like, oh. <laughs> no, they're just like watching for stage to do directions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like the backstage director is just standing. Just yeah. yeah. <laughs> just waiting. But like there's they, a lot of content. So. Have they always done pit? It up there. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. That's like The only time I, I was – last year I was sad because when they did High School Musical, oh, yeah. um, there was no violin part. So I couldn't play. Yeah, they the did like a bunch of like electronic instruments because it's not like a traditional musical. Yeah, so I was sad. I was also sad because that year they said they were choosing between West Side Story, High School Musical, and um, Care Spray, I think. And I was like, you had those three options and you chose High School Musical. Yeah, like Care Spray would have been like, sick. West Side Story would have been awesome. Like Leonard mm -hmm. Bernstein, he's a god. Like, oh my god. I think Bernstein did Hairspray played, too, didn't he? I don't, I don't, I'm not sure, but I know he did West Side Story. And I've yeah. played West Side Story like arrangements and orchestra, and they're so nice. They're, pretty they're sick. so much fun to play. I was like, I want to play the real thing. And they chose High School Musical. And I was like, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think at this so, point, uh, we have gone on a bit long, um, rambling, kind, rambling. Of, <laughs> kind of kind of getting to the point where we can start closing it off. So do you guys have any other shout outs you want to give any closing thoughts, whether it be like, we've talked quite a bit. Normally at this point, I might say something like, do you have any tips for people getting started in this area or things you want to say to like people who might not know what's going on here? Uh, but we've kind of covered most of that. Uh, so do you guys just have any sort of closing thoughts really? Well, starting on instruments is really expensive. First of all, like I yeah. think. The cheapest violin that sounds decent enough to start on is 300 bucks. Yeah, don't buy a clarinet Rent. off of Amazon because it might be blue and made of plastic. You're constantly oh, flat and there's nothing you can do to fix it. Oh, yeah. So funny. I watched, um, you guys know who Two Set Violin is on YouTube? Love them. They're so great. They bought a $60 Amazon violin off Amazon, and it was, I just said Amazon violin off Amazon. But okay, cool. they bought a sixty dollar violin, and it was absolutely trash. Like <laughs> I don't, like I think they were missing like um like the bridge was wrong or something, oh, and Lord. like some the something like it was just fundamentally wrong. Like if you want to start out on violin, at least know it's a financial investment as well. Like I think for all instruments, like oh, yeah. like I, like a grand piano is like the price of a car. Like it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And like um, the viol, like my viol two grand. So and that's not even like the great, like the like that. That's decent. It's not like a, a life violin. So like I'm also in the, looking for a life violin, like in like the three to five grand area yeah. where I can just keep forever. Um, but like if you're starting off for violin, it's three hundred bucks. Your bow would be around fifty. My bow is hundred and fifty, but your bow should be around. 50, 30 to 50 dollars i would say um there's carbon fiber bows or wood bows it's all up to your preference how you want to like how it feels in your hand and the weight of the bow and whatnot um and like yeah don't start below 300 dollars and go to a violin shop don't buy it online buying a violin online is a very risky i think buying any instrument online is a very risky online. yeah risky i got mine online but... unless it's like you should have a um, chance to like test it out 
yeah, yeah, unless it's like a like a piano, like a Yamaha piano or a Steinway or like something that has like a brand like like you know it's gonna be good. Like yeah. um just a like a, a reputation behind it. But for violin, since a lot of them are I think they're moving towards the mass produced side now, but a lot of them are still handcrafted. Yeah. Like you need to try your violin out before you buy it. And I've heard so many horror stories on buying violins online and it didn't end up working out for them. And like, yeah, just go to your, go on Google, look up your local violin shop and support local small business, whatever, all that spiel. And uh, try it out. Try it out. So before you buy. And also when you travel on an airplane, if you have a cello or a bass, buy a seat for that cello or bass. Do not put it under the plane. Do not check it in. Not a good idea. I promise you, it will not come out looking the same way. Also, for violins, um, bring it on carry-on on the airplane as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the airlines are understanding. I think I had two carry-on, and my violin case didn't fit in that little um, the, the the size requirement. But the people were like, "Yeah, we understand. Like, it's a violin. You don't want to put it under because it's cold yeah, down there. It's no, not violins are big, big, Yeah." They'll understand really the nice about that. Yeah, they'll let they'll let you bring it up on board. Um, trust me. Um, so yeah, Th- that's my little tip. Of yeah, um, aspirant jazz saxophone players. That's a really really nuanced uh, area, but um, do lots yeah, of transcribe. Listen a lot. <laughs> Any music really, just listen to what you're trying to play. Pick out things. Go do it yourself. Take blank sheet of music and uh, blank, blank sheet of manuscript paper and just like write what you hear. Learn about theory. Theory is probably Use one of the biggest memos, things that people need to work, like, work on. What? If you come up with like like a lick or a melody in your head, play it and record it on your phone so you have exactly. Save. Yeah, just learn about what you're playing. Learn about where it came from. Try and build on it. Create stuff by yourself. Just sit there with a backing track and just play. It's a really good way to just like learn. Anybody else have any closing thoughts, comments? Um, on our well, on our Black Violin Zoom, um, the the guy said, I think his name was Kevin. He said literally what Nick Peel just said. He said literally what he did is he took songs he liked and played over them and improved over them, and that's how he came to what he did now. And he toured. Not, he's to, he toured with Alicia Keys and he toured with Linkin Park. So, that's sick. yeah, imagine touring with Linkin Park like. Your ears that's are bleeding awesome. the entire time. <laughs> Can't hear anything. You're like, sir, would you like a water? What? <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> and with that, uh... oh, sorry, Matt, I, you have a comment? Sorry, no, one one thing. This is just, if... I'm trying not to make the same point successively, so stop me if I'm repeating myself. But if you, this is more specific. If you like to sing, even if it's just like in the shower or you know, in the car on your way to work or school or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, try finding a group of people to sing with because it's a totally different experience singing with group. Cause I've always, I've always liked to like sing in the car or whatever to music, but it's completely different. And there's like literal physics, I, I think behind it, at least maybe I'm over analyzing what it is that when, you know, like when same uh, frequency sound waves meet, they amplify one another if they're the waveforms match up they amplify and so when you sing the same thing with someone else it like you can feel it like it's different it's one thing when you're playing an instrument and you can hear it but when it's coming out of your body you can feel when the vibrations link up and it's like that's it's one of the coolest yeah it's one of the coolest things i've ever felt been a part of and so it's and it's also like a you know if you become friends with those people it's a bonding experience it's something fun you can do it's like to me i like it slightly more than playing my instrument a because i think i'm better at it b because you can do it anywhere you don't have to have your instrument you don't have to be somewhere where you're not going to disturb people like we were when we were in new york we would literally sing stuff from like our men's our men's ensemble when we were walking down uh walking through central park like we were just we were just walking through on the trip just singing for no reason I'm, just because it was jealous. it was fun like bring, that type of, I can't bring my violin outside the humidity will wreck it yeah so yeah. it's like stuff like that and being able to find a group and people to do it with I think is it's completely different than doing it on your own which I think is also valuable and you know I enjoy 
whenever I get to do it on the car, like when I drive to when I when I, you know when I would go places, um, because I don't do that anymore. I would you know <laughs> sing and make you know nobody does. I would sing in the car. The one, the two chances I've had to drive outside since we've been home, I've been just you know blast music and sing my heart out in the car because mm-hmm. I don't you don't get a chance. I, I I try not to bother the other people in my house or the dogs, so I don't get a chance to do it. But it's one it's like it's for me it's very calming and relaxing and like just blasting out and it's one thing to do it on your instrument it's another thing to physically create the sound yourself that i think is so it's different and it's different with people and so if you get the op- you have the opportunity and you have the interest try it yeah. and That's also like interest. try different genres try different group sizes like oh, yeah. uh, also if you're like a person who likes listening to classical music like um, in a concert setting, like I think um, one of my conductors said to me, the best seat in the house to listen to an orchestra is to be in the orchestra. And yeah, because it's literally surround sound. You're the closest one there. You hear everything. Well, you try to hear everything. I don't know if some people can hear everything. Yeah. Um, but like, <laughs> um, also like try different genres. Like, um, I never thought I could play jazz on the violin. I've only done it like twice. Um, my in seventh grade, no. Ninth, eighth grade, my madman FYO conductor made us play Sing 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 by Benny Goodman nice. on just four, just, no, it's only strings orchestra. And it was the wackiest thing I've ever done. Cause like, not all of us are classically trained. So we don't know how to swing notes. We don't know how to like be in the, the jazz rhythm. All of us are like metronome, metronome, metronome. And you can't do that in jazz. And it was like so weird. I don't know how to explain it but it's just different um do musicals orchestra broadway like broadway is great i mean just do that and yeah and then i think when i was a freshman i had a kid named patrick Byrne. he's at rpnl um he just he graduated a while ago um and he was a rock fan and he would play guitar rock solos on the violin did i like listening to it no um i think it was good not my music taste but he was really into it so kudos to him for doing what he liked to do and when he was playing it like after orchestra like since he had second free just start jamming out um and i was like wow i wish i could do that even though like i wasn't a rock fan like i didn't like listen to that kind of music but like he was super into it um don't like literally don't care what people think about me your music just like do what you want. Someone will like it, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And uh, and if you're having fun, you're having fun. So yeah. If there's legitimate. There's real application to the theory that if if you want something, if you like something, if you're interested in something, odds are there are other people out there who are too. So if you make that, put it into the world, and you'll probably get feedback, especially with you know the power of the internet. There will mm-hmm. there's some group of people who have the same who have that same interest and who you can connect with over that. I think with that, we're kind of ready to close out. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Podcast, but we go on massive tangents. Yeah, <laughs> I got a little worried after like the tenth minute of talking about security at Pinecrest. I was like, I should do something about this. I should do something about this. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, host. <laughs> well, we brought it back, so it's okay. We talked about sports for like five minutes, and like, yeah, you know, yeah. during homecoming when I left at halftime, and it was like. 12 to 7 and then when i was driving down the road passing it was uh like 30 to 7 (laughs) yes like i i'm not saying like like driving the road like literally no i walked to the garage left the garage drove on the road passing the scoreboard and in like a span of 10 minutes it was, it was from 12 to 7 to 30 to 7. That is the only match at Pinecrest I've watched, and I think I got the experience. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, that's about the that's about <laughs> show. Uh, so, right. okay. I guess we'll close it out then. Thank you guys for joining me. It's been a great time. I'll see you boys. Uh, yeah. It's been a great episode. See you guys. Yeah.